Compliance is like sports. You have to plan ahead, work out, stay fit and aim to reach your goals. Interacting with regulators around the globe adds a next level. Communication. Compliance and communication both require tactics and it's teamwork. So I'm privileged to have Sumay Theo from Exxon Mobile and Kevin Pollard from the European Chemicals Agency on our team today to discuss the various ways of interacting with regulators around the globe. Sumay and Kevin, why is the interaction between regulators and industry important? So I'll start with uh, saying that, you know, the chemical industry is a very heavily regulated industry. And as regulations um, are drafted, I think it is important that they are workable. Um, and the chemical industry does have pretty complex uh, supply chain and value chain. And so the ability to provide input um, and to take a look at draft regulations uh, and provide input to make it um, more workable, um, even provide solutions, you know, if, if we can, uh, that would be very important uh, so that whatever uh, regulations are put in place, they're implementable, they are enforceable. Um, the industry itself won't be as adversely impacted while, you know, we meet the same objectives and the, the objectives of the uh, regulations. Okay, great. And Kevin, what's your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Well, I mean, interaction is, is really fundamental to everything that we do. Um, if you really step back, ECA, the European Chemicals Agency, is uh, ultimately a coordinating agency. So we gather information from industry duty holders, um, we structure it and we make it available to the public. Uh, and most importantly, we, we use it as the fuel for our uh, regulatory processes, both in, in ECA and in the member states. So we, we can't really achieve any of this uh, without interacting with industry and, and other, other stakeholders. As, as Sume was saying, we need to make sure that our systems are fit for purpose. So they can be used by a, a diverse uh, array of industry actors. But equally important, more important, is that, that they can reach their policy objectives. So. It's absolutely key to, to everything that we do. Okay. So may who in industry should approach a regulator and when and how? Okay, well, so I think, you know, um, it could be companies themselves uh, who should approach regulators. Um, and I think it, a lot of it depends on where you're at and what the process is like. And I'm going to speak more from maybe an Asian perspective. Um, so in the experiences that uh, the industry in this part of the world has had, uh, we'd, we are usually able to approach them as a company. Maybe the most impacted business uh, company representatives could approach them directly. Um, but typically, we would also approach them through the industry association because whatever is um, an issue to be discussed would be common across uh, the industry. So that would be, I think, um, a very common mode. Uh, and we would want to start um, having dialogues with the regulators uh, before, as early as possible, actually, um, if possible, even before drafts are put in place. Uh, and it should be through the uh, regulatory rulemaking process where possible. Okay, thank you. So joint forces is basically the preferred option. Yes, I think so, because then it, you know, gives um, the whole of industry approach uh, and, and we get um, good representation of where the issues are. I think it's a more efficient process as well. Instead of having, you know, 10 companies talk to them, you get everyone together uh, and you know, we would have common issues. Sumay, that's clear. Kevin, how do you want the industry to interact with ECA? Well, I, I would pick up where Sumay left off. Consolidated approaches are are normally best when we discuss at the, at the system level, for example. Individual companies can contact us via our help desk for specific issues. But I think the most important uh, and, and really the starting point is, is the interaction industry has with us when they're fulfilling their, their legal obligations. We need to see information from them that is complete and correct according to the legal text uh, and crucially that is, that is up to date. Uh, so that's the starting point. Then I would move to two, more, two, two other main arenas of, of, of interaction. So the first is, is what we already touched upon, setting up new systems, new regulations. Uh, and as Sue May said, it's very important to have dialogue uh, that we're setting that up in the right way. The other main area would be, I say, following on our various uh, consultations and calls for evidence that we do in relation to imp impactful risk management. Um, so yeah, we actually have two calls for evidence running right now uh, one uh, for aromatic brominated flame retardants 
and another one for the Chromium 6, both in relation to restrictions dossiers. So there's a couple of examples. But yeah, those, those are the three, I would say, most important areas for interaction where we really need to hear from industry. Sumay, how do you and your industry peers approach regulators and what kind of cultural differences do you think they need to consider? Right. Um, and so I think uh, as we approach regulators, as we interact with them, there must be a, an element of mutual respect um, and that built upon trust uh, and that open dialogue and both sides striving to achieve um, what's best for uh, the industry and for uh, the regulation, uh, that the objectives of the regulation itself. I think uh, the uh, difference in this part of the world, you'd have to factor in the cultural uh, elements as we approach regulators. For example, as you know, the, um, the power distance in Asia is relatively higher than, let's say, in the Western part of the world. And so you'd have to factor that in, um, in for example, who goes and speaks to the regulator, um, the uh, the the way you speak to the regulators uh you know that there could be differences there as well so bottom line respecting the local cultures and factoring that in as we approach different regulators in different parts of uh, asia and the rest of the world as well respect is always important absolutely kevin eka embraces interaction and communication with stakeholders can you share how that is stimulated yeah, well, first of all, I think new or changing legal obligations do tend to attract the attention of industry. Uh, but joking aside, ECA has really invested a lot in having both a, a strategic and a technical framework for this. So everything from the various news channels that we have that push out uh, new information and can trigger action uh, on the industry side, all the way through to our accredited stakeholder organizations uh, and other mechanisms such as user groups targeted to, to different uh, projects. Uh, so we really have a, an end-to-end -end, uh, way of stimulating interaction, uh, which is really on a spectrum from I informing and then, and then triggering action on, on the industry side, all the way through to having direct collaboration and projects. And, and with this suite of, of tools, I think we're able to uh, have the necessary interaction. Yeah. Okay, and what kind of information from industry is helpful for implementing agencies like ECA? Okay, well, I, I would touch a little bit on my, my previous answer. So well, first of all, of course, the, the regulatory information that they are obliged to provide and that this is correct uh, and up to date. Uh, and then secondly, the, 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 the deeper interactions that we have with industry and of course other partners uh, in relation to establishing or adapting our processes. Uh, it's really a balancing act uh, when, when setting up a process. On the one hand, you have attention on the, on the legal requirements, the policy aims, but you also need to understand that you're really working with a diverse uh, range of industry actors. Uh, we need to make sure that the processes are fit for purpose and manageable. So it's, as I mentioned, it's really a balancing act and, and, and that's the, that's, um, that requires that we have information from industry, ways of engaging with them, um, ways to check that our systems and processes are, are fit for purpose. Uh, and then again, uh, last but not least, and I, I touched on this earlier, but it's, it's good to have an opportunity to build on it. So, in addition to the information the industry provides us as part of their regulatory obligations, uh, it's really important that they, they are also uh, using our early consultations or calls for evidence when we're prioritizing or, or implementing risk management, uh, that industry pays attention to those, gets organized up and down the supply chains, as Sue May was referring to, so that we can get as consolidated as possible information we can therefore verify that what we're doing is still achieving the environmental goals, uh, but without any unforeseen or unnecessary socioeconomic impacts. So I think those are the main areas, yeah. Okay, clear. So may is this indeed information industry is willing and able to share? And what else do you think is relevant? Okay, so, you know, I think the bottom line is industry is usually very open to sharing any information they can share as long as it's not confidential, right? Um, I think uh, the confidentiality is where uh, the challenges lie. Um, in maybe in this part of the world, uh, as regulations are developing and uh, the understanding sometimes from regulators um, of the industry itself is, is rather new, perhaps. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to define or to, for, for regulators to understand what confidential information can be. It's not always obvious to them. 
Um, and so there's a lot of dialogue needed there. Um, there were some interesting points that Kevin mentioned um, in the process uh, in EU. It is very structured. It is a regulated process. Um, so the steps, the timing and all that are, are all laid out nicely. Not so in you know many parts of the world. Uh, I think in more developing regions, um, the, uh, the timing isn't always defined. Um, the process may not be there. Uh, it is sometimes driven by, you know, some agencies could be really good at it and some agencies don't really do a lot of consultation. Um, sometimes it's driven by the head of the department. Sometimes there can be processes in place. And so there's a wide variation. And so, you know, to the point about getting organized, um, it does bring some challenges in, in this part of the world to be organized enough. But ideally, yes, we would like to have every impacted industry being consulted. So those are, I guess, some of the challenges um, when it comes to, you know, sharing information. Okay, let's dive a little bit deeper into consultation. Like you mentioned, eh? it's an important interaction mechanism between regulators and industry. What are your experiences, let's start with Kevin, with consultation? Yeah, well, of course, during the last 15 plus years, we have a wealth of experiences with all kinds of consultations in, in relation to the topics that, that, that I've been mentioning. Overall, of course, uh, very positive. We've managed to set up uh, a number of complex systems and processes in a relatively short period of time. We've been able to move forward uh, various risk management opinions towards the uh, European Commission and, and a wide variety of, of other achievements that we simply could not have achieved without consultation with industry and, uh, and other partners. Of course, it doesn't come without challenges. Um, sometimes we're absolutely overwhelmed by the information that we receive. Uh, often this is in fact uh, a symptom of a lack of a coordination, which uh, I, we do acknowledge that this is challenging. So we sometimes get contradictory information, overlapping information, or key information that's buried deep in an attachment within an attachment. We sometimes feel that we're looking for needles in, in multiple haystacks. But um, uh, coming back, as I mentioned, overall, uh, good experiences and, and industry has been able uh, on average, uh, to give us the information that we need, that we're, we're moving in the right direction, we're achieving our policy objectives, uh, and without uh, any unnecessary disruption to the market. Okay. So, May, can you also point out uh, your experiences as well as some regional differences in consultation? Right. Um, I think uh, the experiences we've had, uh, it is, like I said, varying. Um, Oftentimes it's a lot less formal, um, but that also gives us, you know, when, when it happens, um, we are able to sit down uh, and have face-to-face -face discussions to understand each other's points of view. Um, it has happened online, it happens in person. Um, I think clearly being uh, a region with multiple languages, uh, that's going to be one challenge as well, that it may not be uh, in English, the common language that most of industry would be able to uh, uh, connect with, uh, connect on. Um, so, so I think uh, the lack of um, process is challenging in that you have to navigate different approaches in different countries. Uh, but that said, I think uh, there is there is often room uh, and the opportunity to have very good, honest discussions with the regulators so that we all move forward and try to achieve the objectives. And Sume, is it also important to open consultations for the global industry? Yes, absolutely. That is extremely, extremely important. It doesn't happen everywhere, um, but I think it is um, more so happening these days. Um, I think uh, regulators need to understand that the supply chain is really complex and that information that they are seeking may not always lie with the local industry. It may lie with you know, the foreign manufacturer who doesn't have any local um, business footprint. And these could be confidential information that needs to be transmitted. And so the global industry can be impacted, especially as the regulation becomes more complex. And so the consultation process should take into account um, or have a process in place that enables the global industry to weigh in as well. And so I think online presentations uh, or online consultations would be extremely beneficial here. Okay. For all stakeholder interaction, trust is key. You already mentioned it. What trust criteria are relevant according to you, Kevin? 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, maybe I start by highlighting that ECA has recently updated its strategy. We've We've um, published a new five-year strategy a while ago, and building, being a trusted regulator is, is one of the four central pillars, so trust is really a starting point for ECA. Um, for us, that means working in a, in a credible, fact-based, science-based science -based manner, uh, being transparent and open, except, of course, in the realm of confidential information. Um, and also being um, professional, recognizing that differences are differences are a, a, a part of the process. Uh, so working, working with respect and so on. I, th I think those are some of the main elements. As for you, Tsumei? Yeah, I think Kevin, you mentioned it. Um, I think mutual respect, uh, understanding that each party has a part to play, uh, and that we are all trying to achieve um, objectives uh, that are, I think, useful for a society. And so, you know, that, that mutual respect and mutual understanding will then, I think, bring us all to the table um, and have fruitful uh, conversations um, and trying to achieve, um, I guess, the greater good. Okay. And can you both provide an example of effective communication between regulators and industry? Yeah, I can start first. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I was to take an example, uh, the Australian ACIS, uh, previously NICNAS, their consultation process has been very transparent. Um, everything's available online uh, on their website. Uh, it is easy to follow and you can um, just be part of that conversation, even if you're not there in person. Uh, they do accept uh, input from anybody, any stakeholder, whether they're local or outside of the country. Um, I think uh, at uh, other parts of the world, we have, you know, just made appointments as an industry to sit down with the, uh, the regulators and have that kind of a face to face discussion to understand their objectives and for them to understand uh, where the pain points are. Um, and so where we have had just face to face conversations, that's always been very, very useful. Face to face is always useful. Kevin, one of your experiences. Yeah, of course, there are there are many. One to briefly mention, actually, is that we recently had some dialogue with the Australian authorities uh, in terms of how ECA is running some of its prioritization processes and likely we'll have some further collaboration. But maybe to highlight um, uh, a more systematic topic, I would point to uh, the recently relaunched ECA Chem platform, which is our information platform for uh, information on, on chemicals. Uh, and is really a testament to the power of consultation and interaction. Uh, and maybe also one more, if I may, we have at the, at the moment uh, a stakeholder community that we call the Chemical Risk Assessment Stakeholder Community, and they're supporting the update of scientific workloads, both for the REACH and the Biocides uh, regulation, uh, and the parallel development of the KSAR platform, which is a chemical safety uh, assessment tool which is currently being adapted for both regulations. So from, from these experiences, we, we're getting invaluable feedback and we know that we're, uh, we're taking this in the correct direction. Yeah. And are those groups invitation only or anybody can join them? Well, for example, with the, the Chemical Risk Assessment Stakeholder Community, we set that up, I think it was even two years ago. Uh, we have a website for that. Uh, we invited uh, a wide number of applicants. Of course, we had criteria. Uh, the community is now in place. I'm not sure if it's possible still to join, um, but it'd be happy to, to check that after the interview, yeah. Okay, final question. Um, do you have any suggestions to improve the interaction between regulators and industry, or maybe improve the consultation process? I guess speaking um, from this part of the world, uh, having it consistent, a consistent process uh, in every country um, would be very beneficial so that there is predictability in how regulations are being developed um, and the industry would know when to expect to act. Uh, there must be sufficient time given for information to flow, um, you know, even for the industry, industry to just think through um, issues uh, that could be associated with a draft regulation, uh, giving us enough background information to act on, um, and just giving us enough time to, to think through and, and uh, provide uh, our feedback. Uh, those kinds of uh, processes uh, would be useful. 
Um, and if it could be implemented uh, consistently at every country, that would definitely be very useful. Okay, Kevin, any suggestions? Well, I, I don't think I have any game-changing ideas, but maybe one thing that's, that's important to highlight would be the resources uh, on the industry side. I, I, I've mentioned during this discussion uh, that the industry needs to uh, give us complete, correct, up-to-date information, be prepared to respond on our various consultations and interactions when we're building new processes, uh, and also be able to respond on risk management, and none of this happens without resource. Uh, so that's something that's that's extremely important, and then maybe in a different dimension. Uh, we touched on this in the in the trust question, uh, but recognizing that that sometimes there can be strong differences of view on what can be the best approach. That positive conflict is is sometimes necessary and important to achieve uh, uh, the right outcome, and can be done in a professional, friendly, collegial manner. Yeah. Okay, Sumay and Kevin, thank you. Great teamwork. Thank you for sharing your communication and compliance tactics. And I think it's fair to conclude, it's a balancing act. Yeah, that's Indeed. right. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry.